I'm really excited. We're going to be doing a, a second um, message on this series called Family Values, and we're going to be talking about our interactions, and I'm really, really excited about it because I think this is something that, uh, to be honest, is very timely in a lot of our culture and what's going on in our culture. And I don't know about you, but I've felt as though uh, our interactions are really, really different, different especially after... The, um, like COVID and pandemic times, it's just even been more weird to have interactions with people. So today we're going to be talking about what God has to say about our interactions, how we interact with each other. And, um, and believe it or not, he has a ton to say about it. And um, I think it could actually be very, very helpful for a lot of the things that we're facing today. And so let's pray and jump straight into it, all right? God, I just ask that you speak today, that you speak to our situations, Lord, wherever we're at that you would just be here, be with us, speak to us directly. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Should have prayed for the draft, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> um, hey, uh, so I don't know. Did anybody ever work in the food industry? Anybody ever food service? Okay, I did too. It was, it was, uh, it was actually like I, I really loved it for a while um, because I got to interact with a whole lot of people. Um, and I'm decently an extrovert and decently have a lot of energy. Um, and so if you never noticed, um, and so, uh, it was, it was something really fun for me. Um, I actually worked at Olive Garden for a while up in Kirkland, Washington, and, um, where everybody's family. And so if you ever want to go to Olive Garden, get that endless soups and salads, man, it's, it's something else. I'll tell you what. Um, but it, it was a, it was a fun time. Um. Anyway, I, I remember one time I was, I was serving. Here, here's the thing. I'll tell you what. I've, I've served for quite a number of years before um, I became a pastor. And one thing I realized about serving is um, anybody who says that people are inherently good has never worked in the service industry. Um, that, that is... Uh, further from the truth, a lot of things come out in the service industry, and you find out a lot about people. Um, and so I remember I had had a really, really tough day with very, very tough customers that day. And then even worse when, you know, like things just weren't coming out the way they were supposed to be, and then you got to run back. And so I'm exhausted. And, uh, and finally, there's like a lull in the day, right? And so there, there's a lull in the day, and I have this older couple, probably in their 70s, that um, came in, and they were like, oh, sorry, that was... Ah, see, I made a mistake there. Come on, young guy. Um, anyway, but, but uh, I remember they were in their 70s. They, they, they walked in, and um, they, it, when they sat down, they, they were my only table. And so I was able to just kind of really talk to them, interact with them, and they were lovely. They were incredible. I loved talking to them, and I found out through just conversation that they were actually Christian and that they went to a local church. And they found out that, you know, I was coming from, from Arizona. And so at the time, they were, like, asking me all these questions about Arizona and what brought me out here. And I, I remember telling him this because he, the man asked me this question. He said, so what was so great about coming up to Kirkland, Washington, that you had to move up here? And I said, man, I'll be honest. I just really love the church community up here. And he looked at me straight in the eye, and he was like, can you please not use that word? And I was like, whoa. And, um, and he said, without skipping a beat, he says, I, I just don't like the word community. He was like, because the church is supposed to be a family, not just a community. He was like, you know, the difference is uh, community, you just, you leave it. And, you know, you get mad and you can leave it. He was like, family, we fight for family. And I was like, whoa, my life is being transformed right now at Olive Garden. And the next question I asked him was if he needed more soup and salad. Because, um, you know, I had to do my job. I was good at my job. But, but that moment has impacted me for so long. And um, it's something that, that has actually resonated with me to this day is this idea of family. It's something crucial that we need in our lives, whether that be something that you have as an immediate family or whether it be a church family, but that idea of people who you can lean on, people you can rely on, people that allow you to remove the mask, that allow you to just be yourself, right? And so I started thinking about the things that, 
that families do. They're, they're committed to one another, right? That's, that's the idea, is that they're committed to one another and that they let us be our honest selves and tackle some of the things that are deep within us. <sighs> Sometimes I feel like nowadays it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it feels like we get more anxiety about the Thanksgiving family dinner. Nowadays, it feels like we're getting anxiety about meeting up with family and friends because of the topics and the things that are going to get brought up. I mean, have you ever had issues with this? Is, is this idea that we're, we're about to go meet up with the family? Don't bring up this thing and make sure you're, you're careful about this. And at this point, there, there's a new Bible that we're writing about just interactions with our families. And it, it's so much anxiety. It's so much stress. And I, I consider the issues that always arise, okay, it's usually something that lines up with this, and if you're either a child or a grandparent or a parent, it probably lines up somewhere in, in this spectrum, is either the expectations put on you because of family, the questions that the, the family might ask, the political opinions that they might bring up, or just the normal opinions that they might bring up. And even if, as I'm mentioning them, some people are probably wondering, is he going to bring anything up? No, no, I'm not. Don't worry. But these are the family dynamics we have today. They're, they're stressful. And no matter what role you play in the family, it could cause a lot of disunity lately, a lot of anxiety lately. So what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to deal with this? Well, I think first we have to recognize that we live in a culture that seems to have some kind of sway and some kind of motive to divide us. And so that's something we're already fighting. We're already fighting the division that's inside of our culture. How do we tackle this? I think Jesus has a lot to say about this. I think God has a lot to say about this. But I found one passage that we even talked about last week as we related to marriage, but I, I really love this passage as it relates to our interactions. We're going to go into a, a verse called Philippians 2, 1 through 4. This is written by a guy named Paul. His life gets radically transformed by Jesus. Um, his, his name used to be Saul, and because of how much of a change he had, his name is now Paul. And he says this to other believers who their lives have been transformed by Jesus as well. He says, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Jesus, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me this favor. So he's saying, this is, this is what I'm asking. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help, others, and help others get away. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. In a different translation, I, I love how it says it. It says this, make my joy complete. This is Paul speaking to other believers. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being in one spirit and of one mind. This is the call that Paul has for us. He says, you're going to deal with a lot of interaction. This is not him assuming that this was going to be easy. This is him saying, this is going to be difficult, but what I'm asking out of you is, because of the transformation that Jesus had in your life, this should be the way you should interact. And so today we're going to talk about three things that Paul talks to us about, that would actually help our interactions. And the first, the first one I want to get out of this passage, actually, is prioritizing unity. Prioritizing unity. What does it mean to prioritize unity? Here's, here's what this passage is actually not saying. In its original language, it is not saying that we're supposed to agree on everything. It is not. And I think too often we try to do that. We try to agree. We try to persuade people into our opinion. We try to make sure that there's, there's a, a complete agreement in opinion. How is that working out? It's not. Because 
It's just not going to get us anywhere. So what is he calling for? He's calling for us instead to understand that we need to reach unity, not agreement. This appeal is this. It's, it's making unity the priority over our own opinions. Setting opinions aside for the sake of unity, that doesn't mean that our opinions had to change. I, I, I don't know. Did, any, did anybody play sports growing up? Anybody play sports? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I played sports. I know I don't look like it, but I, I play a lot of sports. Um, and um, I played soccer. I played basketball, believe it or not, okay? Um, if you've ever seen me not on stage, you're like, seriously? And I'm like, yes, I, I definitely played basketball. And I played soccer, probably the greatest sport in my opinion. Um, but uh, I played soccer for some time. And I remember uh, one of the first times I get on the field, they, um, they give me the play, and the coach is telling me, hey, this is what is going to happen. You're going to get the ball at this point. You're going to pass it to that guy, and he's going to make the goal. Okay? All I heard in that moment was I'm getting the ball. That's all I heard at the moment. Uh, I'm like five or six years old, and I'm just super excited. I finally get the ball. And so, um, so we're, we're on the field, we're on the pitch, and the ball comes over to me, and I'm just so excited. Okay, I'm like, this is my moment to shine. Everybody's looking at me, so I've got the ball right in front of me. And I look at the goal right in front of me, and I'm like, this could be a moment. This is the greatest moment. And so then I go after it. And, and you know, the, the goalie looked a little familiar. Um, and so as I'm going closer and closer to the goal, I, I shoot it in. It makes it in. I'm celebrating. My team is not. I found out there's a reason that the goalie looked familiar. Um, he was a friend. He was a teammate. And uh, you're not supposed to score on your own team. And um, I, I, I didn't make the play. I didn't make the play. Um, at the moment, it was about me and my ability to shine. I found out this, that in sports, you only win when you make the play. You don't win by just being a star, by just being an individual. You don't win sports by being right. You win them by making the play together. This is the thing, is when you're on a team and you truly become one team, and you're fighting for the unity of the team, you prioritize the team over your own personal gain. I believe that our families win when they know that we're fighting for them, not against them. I believe that our families win when they know that we're fighting for the unity of our friendship. We're fighting for the unity of our friends. We're prioritizing the unity of these interactions and these relationships. This might mean that we've got to push our opinions to the sidelines for a minute in order for love to take the field. And that's difficult. That's difficult. Because we live in a culture that has given every single one of us a microphone and a platform to talk about our opinions. And it's really, really hard. Try your best to go a week without hearing somebody's. It's hard. But the people that make the biggest differences are the people that value the person in front of them, that prioritize the unity around us. So the first one is that, prioritize unity. The second one is this, practice humility. Practice humility. Something that he talks about is uh, is not seeking your own advantage, but he says, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. This idea of humility that Paul's asking out of us I started thinking about a phrase that is not very popular in culture, but I think it should be, and it should definitely be popular within the church. I was wrong. That one phrase, I was wrong. Why? Because isn't that the premise of our faith to begin with? I was wrong, therefore I turned from my way to follow God's way. I was wrong. But for some reason, 
we believe that that's the last time we're ever going to be wrong. No, this, this is probably just the first time we're going to recognize it. And so the ability to have enough humility to say, oh, I was wrong. I, I get into this fight with my wife a lot. Um, and everybody's like, man, you fight too much with your wife. No, I just tell you about it. And then uh, sometimes I tell her after I tell you guys. And she's like, oh, I heard about that. You told them that? And I'm like, I should have asked you permission. Um, so anyway, when you go upstairs and pick up your kid, don't tell her I told you the story. I'm just kidding. No. Um, save me another fight. Today. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no. Uh, uh, this fight that we always get into is this idea of uh, me underestimating time. Here's the thing. I don't like using GPS, all right? Um, I, I spent a good amount of time in, in Los Angeles growing up. I know the roads decently well, and so as much as I can relieve myself of using a GPS, I just don't like it, okay? I'm sorry. I'm that guy on the road. But, um, but something that comes with that is I never actually see how much time it takes to get places, so I'm, I'm trusting on my memory. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it probably takes like 45 minutes to get there. It probably takes 30 minutes to get there. And I always underestimate. And so, and she continually calls me out on it, okay? So she's always like, hey, you're wrong about that time. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, it takes 45 minutes to get there. The other day, she got so heated about this. And she's like, you keep underestimating time every time. And I'm like, I, I mean, I would argue not every time. And she was like, well, how long does it take to get from here to here? from point A to point B, and I'm like, 45 minutes. And she was like, an hour and a half. And I'm like, look it up. Yeah, it was an hour and a half, all right? Um, but but here's, what I, here's what I thought was interesting. So then I go on, and there's a little feature, if you don't know this, about Apple Maps, where you can put what time you want to leave um, and see what the traffic will be like around that time. It's never accurate. But, um, but I, I looked up. Well, look, technically, if we left at 11 p.m., it would be 45 minutes. And she looks at me, and she was like, you just have to be right, don't you? Uh, um, I, I started thinking about this same idea that uh, I feel like too often, even when we're wrong, we're still aiming to be right. Even when we're wrong. I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, I was wrong. And it took so much out of me to have the humility to recognize that I could be wrong. This is, this is what humility will do. It'll, it'll remind us that we can be wrong. It'll, it'll remind us to validate someone else for what they might be saying. You see, how does this play out practically in, in an interaction? Usually it plays out this way. Being able to hear somebody else and believe for a minute that they might have something good to say, that they might have something of value to bring. Putting ourselves to the side for just a minute to hear somebody else, to value somebody else. Why is this important? Because uh, conversations, they, they require multiple people. And I feel like there are a ton of people that are walking away from monologues thinking they just had conversations. How many, how many times does this happen in a day? How many times could we shift this in our own lives every single day? One of the greatest values that, that we can display as followers of Jesus is our ability to listen, to value, and respond. This allows humility in our interactions. You know, one of the, one of the greatest examples um, I... I recently met through this is actually one of um, our people that we have. Um, his name's Lloyd, and we're, he's incredible. Can we give it up for Lloyd? He's going to be... Let me, let me tell you what he's going to do after this service. After this service, he'll be at this cross over here. And every single week, he's at this cross. And I want you to know what it means to be over there. It means to listen to every single person's story. Every single person's story, seeing the value in the person, seeing the value in the story. And uh, I don't think I ha I've had a time where he hasn't, but I want to be safe and say nearly every time he responds to the person's need and to the person's like, position in, in their lives. 
and he does it with scripture. This is a man that knows humility. This is a man I, I personally see as a hero of my faith. And I'm telling you, there are so many people that show this example every single day. They're the people changing lives. They're the people changing the world. I think we're called to do that together. I think every single one of us are called to do it together by means of our interactions. The last one is this, okay, is facilitate forgiveness. Facilitate forgiveness. There's a verse um, where Paul talks about this. This one's really, really cool. Um, He says this. Sorry, I wait for it just like you do. Um, Make a clean break with all cutting and, and backbiting and profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. Now, this is a paraphrase of what is, what is being said in Scripture, but what I like is this. Uh, in, in the original text, it says this. It just says it this way. It says, uh, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. But what I love about this part is it describes how Christ, how Jesus has forgiven you quickly and thoroughly. Quickly and thoroughly. How quickly do we apologize? How quickly do we get to the point where we apologize in our interactions? Think about that. I've heard this said before. Even if you messed up 1%, apologize for the 1%. Why? Because we should continually be in a state of knowing when we've been wrong and turning from it. We mess up all the time. We do, but how many times do we facilitate a moment for reconciliation? This is not to live a guilty life. Instead, it's to make sure we free ourselves from any guilt by asking for forgiveness. Don't skip the step of creating a moment of reconciliation. Don't skip it for a minute. Um... I also had a friend, I just need to say this, I had a friend all the time that people would ask for forgiveness because they were trying to create this reconciliation moment and it was awesome, like that people would be really, really kind to him. And um, he he always always, um, forgave them and never apologized. Don't be that person either. (laughs) Like, um, I I think too often we, we were like, okay, cool, like, I'm sorry, and we don't recognize, hey, maybe I played a role in this. Maybe there's something I did to facilitate the same thing. Let me find it and let me apologize for it because the point, again, is not to be right. It's to be united. The point is for us to to find unity, facilitate forgiveness, and create family. Bria's dad does this thing in their family culture that I think is super cool. Um, When they were growing up, he, as a parent when they messed up, would apologize to their kid. And they would explain why they were apologizing. Because they said, hey, we want you to be able to recognize when you're wrong. And we need to be able to recognize when we're wrong in order to show that. Create this rhythm in your your family. Create this rhythm in, in your interactions and your friends. Forgiveness breeds trust. Okay? And it's through trust that we have the foundation for healthy relationships. Therefore, forgiveness needs to be something that's at the forefront of our minds in our interactions. Why do we do all of this? Why do we do all of this? Well, I think as we continue the verse that we originally looked at, the Philippians verse, we get a really good reason. He says this, Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. 
Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago uh, dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. We do this because we try to reflect that guy. We try to reflect Jesus. We aim to be like that guy. We aim to be like Jesus. Because it won't just change our world. It'll change the world around us. It'll change everything around us. This past weekend, um, or this past week, I was on YouTube and I was scrolling, um, and something popped up, and I think it, it just said like something like, this is what the church should be. And I was like, well, I'm curious, what should it be? And I clicked it. And it was a video of this pastor that was on stage, and you can look it up, it happened about two weeks ago. It's this guy in San Antonio, Texas. It's this, guy, it's this pastor that's preaching on stage. And some guy from, from the far out, now this is a huge, huge church, some guy from far off in the audience yells out profanity in the middle of, of the message and just starts blurting out a bunch of profanity to this pastor. And this pastor hears it, and he stops for a minute, and he was like, hey, man, um, you know, I'm trying to preach. Let's talk after or something. And he, he starts saying something about his story. And so the pastor literally had just started his message. He had just read the passage. And as he's, as he's hearing this profanity from this guy, pushes his notes aside, readjusts his mic, takes off his glasses, and invites the homeless guy that was speaking profanity up to the stage and invites the guy that brought him. This homeless guy tells everybody his story that he was about to end his life right before service. But this one guy, this guy that was a part of, of the church and had gone to the previous two services, had heard the message of reaching people, reaching the lost and all this stuff, and went out and did what was being preached. And he was kind to a neighbor and he gave somebody food and he heard somebody's story, and this homeless guy ends up coming because of that. And this pastor starts realizing that this is a moment for the church, that his message could be pushed aside for the message that was being preached in these people's actions. And he starts talking about this guy's story, and they, they start having a moment as a church, and I'm telling you, it's beautiful. Go back on YouTube and look at it. But what I thought was awesome was this pastor was able to push aside his agenda, his moment to be right, his moment to do whatever it is that he felt like he needed to do for something that God called him to do. For, for God to have a moment where he let somebody else speak. He let somebody else say something that would change that room forever. Seeing just first and foremost, the picture of, of the gospel in a story. I believe that that's what he's calling us all to. And so, I'll leave you with this. Is that I believe that when, when it comes down to it, this kind of attitude is transformative for our families, but it's also transformative for our church family and how we interact with each other. It's also transformative for this world. I believe that as we all read from the same scripture, multiple churches across the nation and the world right now, we could change this entire world, and regardless of what culture wants to use to divide us, I believe we have something stronger that wants to bring us together, and that's Jesus Christ. And so I want to pray for our families. I want to pray for our church family, but I also want to pray for our friendships. 
our relationships that we have. And could I just ask you, could everybody just close your eyes and bow your heads for a minute. This is just a moment that I want to I wanna have is start thinking of that person. Think of that person that's been difficult, that you want a relationship with, but it's just been difficult. Maybe, it, maybe it's your child. Maybe they're an adult now. They've veered off from family opinions and family, family thoughts or expectations. Maybe for you it's a grandparent or a parent that you feel estranged with. Because there's too much dividing you guys, too much, too much junk and interactions. And as you think of that person, I want you to think about that person as we pray to close. And I want you to personally in this moment, as I pray for us, I want you to personally pray for that person. And that God would bless your interactions with that person. That God would lead you in those interactions. That you would be able to prioritize unity, practice humility, and facilitate forgiveness. And that it might even transform their lives. So let's pray. God, I pray for our families. I pray for our friendships, our relationships. I pray for our church family. And Lord, as every single person in this room is is thinking of that person that they want, a deeper relationship with. They want healing in their interactions. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit be in the middle of that. Lord, I thank you because you care about these things. You care about them deeply. And Lord, I ask that even as we walk out this, this morning, that we'd walk out with a new light looking at you and looking less at ourselves and looking at what you can do through us. Lord, we dedicate this to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.